Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Welcome to Spirit Reflections on another episode Around the Fire. My name is Fred Gouveia here from New York. And tonight we have a very special guest, one of the most amazing living legends of music, John Malcheri, who's just a few blocks away here in Chelsea. John, good afternoon and thank you, thank you for being with us. I'm very happy to be with you, Fred G. Fred G, he's, he pronounced it perfectly, wonderful. <laughs> For those that are coming to the channel for the first time, I'll tell you a little bit about Spirit Reflections. This was a channel that was started last year during the pandemic, and I wanted to invite scientists, artists, philosophers, people from all walks of life to share their personal stories. If they have a spiritual tool or a faith of some sort, to share with us how that faith and those tools have shaped who they are and the work that they do today. We have broadcasts every Wednesdays in English, and on Saturdays in Portuguese. And we have a YouTube channel that we invite you to, to like and subscribe. And we're always welcoming suggestions for topics, for feedback, and any ideas that we can all sit around this mythical fire that we talk about. And brings us back to a time when we were hunter-gatherers going around in small groups of people that we trusted, that we spent our entire lives around and at the end of the day we would light a fire in the middle of nature sit sing songs laugh cry and look up into the sky and ask ourselves what are we doing here where do we come from where are we going so when we sit around this mythical fire virtually we come with that spirit of wonder and open-mindedness to learn from our guests and John is an incredible human being whose biography we can spend the entire duration of this, this episode just reading. But I'll be very brief and read uh, a snippet of his bio for those that have never met John. His distinguished and extraordinary career has brought him not only to the world's greatest opera companies and symphony orchestras, but also to the musical stages of Broadway and Hollywood as well as the most prestigious halls of academia. John is regarded as the world's leading performer of music of Hollywood's Emmy Gray composers. He has taken the lead in the preservation and performance of many kinds of music and has supervised, conducted the premieres by composers as diverse as Debussy, Stockhausen, Korngold, Bernstein, Hindemith, Elfman, Ives, and Short. As a recording artist, Mr. Malcheri has over 70 albums to his name, and he's the recipient of Grammy, Tony, Olivier, Drama Desk, Edison, Cannes Classique, Billboard, two Diapasons d'Or, three Emmys, and four Deutsche Schallplatten, all these awards. But what's most important is this is a very humble, incredibly inspirational man, and we're going to understand a little bit about his journey today and what continues to be in the backdrop of all, all of his achievements. So, John, you have the word. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Oh, well, um, I was born in New York uh, in 1945. Uh, I grew up in Queens, blue collar uh, area. Um, I went to public schools uh, until I went to college, which was the first time I left home. Um, my life, I guess, was guided by some wonderful people, most of them women. Of course, my mother, but I had two aunts, one who brought me to Broadway, and that was Aunt Jenny and Aunt Rose, who brought me to the Metropolitan Opera as a little boy. And my next door neighbor, Aunt Tessie, who wasn't my real aunt, but in those days, you never called anybody, you wouldn't call her by her first name. And Aunt Tessie had a piano. So before I even went to kindergarten, I would spend hours at Aunt Tessie's piano, what I'm figuring it out, before I could read, uh, before I knew anything, I was playing on her keyboard. And to this day, you know, when people say, do you have perfect pitch? And I say, I actually don't. I have something called perfect, whatever that would be, pitch retention, which is, I know that this key is the same key as the key of that. But if you ask me if that F major, E flat, I say, you know, I really don't know because when I learned those keys, I didn't have letters. <laughs> I didn't have words. <laughs> so uh, I had uh, encouragement, but really, uh, I don't know. I just followed some 
world of, of what music was. I was brought up as a Roman Catholic and mm -hmm. uh, I took that extremely seriously. Um, I, I was what you call a good boy. Um, when my dad gave me my first allowance, uh, it was, uh, I think, 50 cents. And uh, he asked me what I did with it the next week. And I told him I put it in the poor box at church because I kept thinking of the things I wanted. And then I thought, but there are the people who, who really need it more than I do. By the way, my father got very angry. <laughs> <laughs> he did not go to church. <laughs> uh -huh. So, so you, you had your faith, a very serious approach to your faith in your upbringing and a lot of exposure to music of all kinds from a very early age. Yeah, yeah. And I think the first place I heard it was mostly from television. And in those days, everything was on television. So, Fredji, you know, you would have uh, NBC had its own opera company. And you, you also had Broadway and jazz and, you know, live music all the time and all kinds of music. So you never felt that this was more serious than that. This was, you know, all happening and it was all just given to you. And it sat next to female roller derby and a cooking right. show and Lamp Unto My Feet, which was a spiritual show and Bishop Fulton Sheen. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen would give these homilies. I mean, he was, a, he was Catholic, but he never really spoke in terms of specifically Catholic things. He spoke in, in terms of behavior and societal, uh, how, what is real morality in a profound sense without discussing it in any specific religious way. Um, so, you know, and cartoons and everything that you would imagine. But in those days, because there were three networks and a few local stations, everything was on offer. I mean, everything. And as I said, there was no kind of like, um, category that this was good, this was bad, that right. everything was nestled against everything. And so there was a kind of a, for me, it was like a porthole. I mean, the porthole where I could see the whole world. Uh, there were, you know, there was, there were programs in which there, there was a program called Wisdom, uh, another one called Life Begins at 80. Now, if you think about that in 1950, let's say, um, that mean I knew who Albert Einstein was. I knew who right. uh, I knew who Picasso was. They were on television, you know. So Salvador Dali was on television, and you know you you would you would know these people. Uh, Toscanini was the conductor of, of the NBC Symphony. So that was the right. first conductor I saw was Toscanini. And I, you know, I here's the other thing. I loved watching it, but then I wanted to replicate it. There's a, you know, a human, a human desire we have, we are mimics, right? We are right. all of us humans, we are mimics. And fortunately, and I really mean fortunately, we are imperfect mimics. So we repeat things we hear, um, but we never can repeat them exactly the same way, either by choice or just by our lack of ultimate sensitivity. We are close. And that creates a kind of uh, cauldron of, of creativity. It's like this, but not, and it's personal, and it, it replicates. So when I saw puppet shows, I had a puppet theater. When I heard music, I wanted to play music. When I saw theater, I wanted to produce theater. Um, and so I've always had that desire to replicate and to share. So Beautiful. meaning in, my, in the book about conducting, which I is this one, that. everyone, by the way, everyone, you have to check this book out, is such an incredible journey of joy into the world of music, the backstage. And I recommend the audiobook version because it's read by John himself. So you really get the intonation, the feeling, <laughs> and he makes the story come alive off the paper much more in the audio version. So highly recommend it. Thank you. Uh, but you know, uh, when people say, what, why is a person a conductor? And the funny thing about it uh, is that the great conductors are all different. I once said this, you know, mediocre conductors are very similar to each other, but the great ones are really all different. And in my life, um, I've worked with some really great conductors. And you could never confuse Tchaikovsky with Bernstein. And you could never confuse either of them with, say, Carlo Maria Giulini. And uh, 
But the thing that they had was they were a kind of amplification of themselves. The, right. They allowed themselves to be themselves. As yeah, a it's a question of authenticity, <laughs> exactly. I, I would say, right? Yeah, because, well, yes, uh, there's a play by Alfred de Musset called Lorenzaccio. And uh, de Musset wrote this play about Lorenzo de' Medici. Uh, and I know we're now, it seems like we're in a tangent, but we're not quite. No worries. And uh, Lorenzaccio, which is an Italian name for that dumb, stupid Lorenzo, when you add the Accio at the end. I mean, I'm Gian Accio, right? And you're Fred mm -hmm. Accio. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, in, in five acts, it tells about Lorenzo de' Medici, who is pretending to be uh, timid, but he really, his goal is to murder his uncle who's married his mother, very much like Hamlet. It's called the French right. Hamlet. And what makes uh, de Musset's play so interesting is that it was not written to be performed on stage. It was written as literature. So in a period when you couldn't really switch from one scene to another the way you can in a movie, you could in your mind. So the play right. is written to be performed in your mind. But the point of this book, uh, of the play, is that the moment comes when Lorenzo can murder his uncle, but he's unable to because in French, his mask is collé à peau. The mask has stuck to his skin. And I remember reading that and thinking, I never want to be anyone but me. And if you don't like the way I perform music or what I think, okay, but I'm a very bad actor, but I might be very good at playing me. And that has right. been my journey. And yeah, that was and true. I, and that, by the way, I'm sorry, that was true no, of Bernstein, for goodness sakes. It was a, he was a million times Leonard Bernstein. I was just going to mention him, John. You worked closely with him for 18 years of your life. So you were able to see him on, off the stage in the intimacy of conversations yeah. about people. And he was always himself on a really deep level, right? Oh, yeah. And he was always himself when he was performing. I mean, there was no Leonard Bernstein who was different you know, in his living room from Dan Leonard Bernstein standing in front of the Orchestre National de France or whatever. He, it was the same person. Again, take it or leave it kind right. of thing. And, you know, in, in accepting yourself, there's a kind of vulnerability along with that strength. It's ironic because, you know, the thing and its opposite actually always right. create the thing, right? And we can talk about that later. But there can be no darkness without light. There cannot right. be they cannot be night without day. Uh, so uh, Lenny was always Lenny. But the thing is, he once asked me, you know, what is your strength to come from? Um, which is a funny question. I mean, every now and then Lenny would just like throw out a philosophical question at you. And <laughs> I said, my vulnerability. And then he said, that's because you're a genius. I mean, why did <laughs> funny, that's great, which was a really <laughs> shocking, but but really, with Lenny being Lenny and having really nothing to hide, you couldn't deny it. I mean, you could say, I don't like it, or I, but you couldn't deny the force of the truth, you know? And so I've always gone that way. And, and the thing about conducting is the great ones, and I don't claim to be that at all because we are all in the process of becoming, right? Reggie, we're absolutely. becoming. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and, and conducting, because that first book that I wrote it, it is, is about the mystery of what I fundamentally do, which is, which is you know, being a conduit, being a messenger. Uh, that's all we are. And after all, what is it? What is what is a, a an angel? It, it's a messenger. a messenger. That's all it means. Speaking right? of conduit, John, you mentioned something in this book which I found very striking because I experienced that twice in my life, and I was at a loss for words. It took me a while to come back to my senses because it was so powerful. You mentioned something of an electrical current that many times you feel arriving at a rehearsal or during and after a performance. Can you describe a little bit how that feels and then maybe we can go into maybe the spiritual reasons behind it? We can take guesses at it? Yeah, well, um, if you're a conductor, and, and, and I might mention this in the book, I don't remember, but in English, we call what I do uh, to be a conductor. Um, in other languages, you know, maestro is really master, 
you know, or dirigent in German is director. Director. A chef d'orchestre is the chief of the orchestra, let's say, right? Um, sometimes you hear the word leader, uh, but conductor is the perfect word because we conduct the energy in the sense, on the physical sense, in the electromagnetic sense, in the, some spiritual sense. The, the music is like a recipe in front of us. It tells you how many teaspoons of sugar and a pinch of this and of that. And it goes, it, it's a book. And we are the only ones with the book, right? Everybody yeah. in front of us, the orchestra, only has one part of the book, the flute line, the, the viola part. They, they do not have in front of them the other parts. So we possess the total recipe. Now, how do we conduct, in that sense, all of those people who are doing different things to make the air vibrate? Because that's what sound is. It's vibrating air. Now, think about this. A trumpet player goes into a mouthpiece. That. And that little into the mouthpiece will evoke the air to vibrate, and by changing the length of the tube, will have a different note. But an oboist will put his or her two lips together in a double reed, like that. A flute player is blowing across the hole, like that, right? Now, just go through the whole orchestra about that. But a triangle player is going ting, and the ting happens as the little triangle beater pulls away from the metal. It, it, right. you, don't, you don't hit it like that. You actually draw the sound out of it. Right. Timpanist, boom. Violin, it is right, takes his or her arm and pulls horsehair, which is made a little rougher by using rosin, across what used to be the small intestine of an animal, but now it's you know wrapped around plastic and and that pulling it makes the string vibrate. All these people, there can be 90 of them, there could be 14 of them, there could be 100 of them, they all do different things to make the sound happen, and the conductor is going, and they do it, and they do it together, <laughs> right? So it, are we talking about something that's impossible? Yes, and only possible because everybody pulls together and wants it to happen the synchronicity, the simultaneous sound event. And in many theaters, there's a distance between the back of the stage and right where you are. So the violins are next to you and they're going pizzicato, they go tink, and that tink happens exactly with your beat. Whereas the timpanist, who is way far away, has to already, is going to be late because right. this has happened close to you. So there's an agreement among all these players, this is the genius, the collective genius of orchestra. They all have to adapt to each other, listening, looking and listening all the time, and also understanding where they fit in the mosaic of sound, knowing that they don't have the book. I've got the book. Right. right? Now, once you stand in front of all these people and you get an immediate sense that they already don't like you or they know who you are and they love you or they're not so sure or the music is something they really know well or this is a piece they don't know or they've heard that this is a terrible whatever they kind of become a very uh, a, a, an, an entity because you are the outsider who has been in, inserted into them like movie. they're a living organism that exists on its own but in order to make them come to life you need this outside element that's right, yes. which which solidifies them either as a as a positive element or maybe a negative one. One you have to seduce into believing into why why should they follow you? Right. You know, when we start as conductors, we're in our twenties, and everybody in the room is older than you. I mean, you're younger than their children sometimes. Right? Yeah. And so and and this kid is saying violas. I want that to be a little shorter on the up. Well, why should they why should they listen to that kid? Right. Right. So, going back to your early question when I was growing up in Queens, when I was a kid, I found when people would say, what are we going to do? And I'd say, let's skate. And everyone would skate. Or I'd say, let's color. And everyone would color. I don't know why. But for some reason, when I would say things like that, people would say, okay, let's do that. So there's something 
about there's an, an innate leadership impulse perhaps yeah and 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 the willingness by other people to go okay let's do what he's saying okay but and it's not about being a boss it's right. just like but the electric current current so the moment you stand there and you lift your hands up something you every everybody who's been in a religious event somebody reaches up right the hand comes up we respond to this we respond to this we respond to this um and remember all these players are using their bodies their breath their arms their hundreds of thousands of hours of work solitary work as children and they all donate into this thing called music and they all adapt to each other now from the moment you start from the first that inhalation before a piece of music begins there is something buzzing uh, it's a, it is l absolutely what we could call electric we we are electric. communicating without a word being spoken i mean this is non verbal this is and, and in addition fredji you know people are so, we are so sensitive we are we are in one sense really dumb you know i once said if god if there is this god person um that god person created us just smart enough to know that god exists and just dumb enough that we can't quite figure out who this god person is right, right. so we 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 were like uh, learning how to swim in a swimming pool where sometimes under the water sometimes our nose comes out but what happens in this period of of a piece of music from the moment you reach up and sometimes it's just like that just that and sometimes it's that it's something that has no bottom so that everybody in the orchestra goes like down you are connected to everybody in that making the sounds because mm -hmm. i'm not making any sound and this journey goes on in time now when there's an audience added to this then the audience becomes co uh performer they they are they're yeah. doing as much work as everyone else if you, if they lock into you and lock into what they're doing i mean i'm not doing it i'm just opening it up for everyone to do this together which right. again is why the word conductor is so apt accurate when it's, right? when it's over you know there's applause and i had i remember i had to learn how to bow on my first concert uh, when i was i guess 21 at yale I, I i i i gave a concert and i had studied with a conducting teacher and all of that and i remember getting a a note from uh the wife of the man who led Brantford college at yale and she said it was a wonderful concert but we have to teach you how to bow <laughs> because i was so un I, i was embarrassed to take any credit quite frankly right but right. i had to learn to accept the credit from the audience because i was somehow rejecting them by not accepting it now there was a great opera singer named birgit nielsen who who very much looked after me as a teenager she was a wonderful wonderful great wagnerian soprano big hearted wonderful when she would bow she would she would come up after a 5 hour Wagner opera and she would stand there and she would put her hands here and reach up wow it was one it was Beautiful. the most wonderful bow acceptance of the audience to their participation in making her performance possible and that Beautiful. was a great lesson for me and that by the way is the electricity i'm talking about because when that performance is over for at least a half hour and maybe a day you're really not yourself you're not wow. normal so you you say things you know maybe there's a reception maybe not maybe you're just going back to some hotel room where you've saved a sandwich um because the bar is closed but you may have a conversation then you just hope you didn't say something too stupid because actually <laughs> you weren't normal you are electrified in a yeah. sense and yes. super open that it's hard for some people even to deal with that depending on where they're coming from right well that's right because most people's jobs are not necessarily attached but you know when you see rock and roll people uh, they really get 
into that. And that's mm -hmm. when you can also get into tremendous trouble because you, you know, if, if that electric thing is going so long, you, you don't know who you are and your choices can be really bad um, because you're still living in a world where those choices will be judged by people who are not on that electrical high, right? And I'm just curious regarding this electrical current, is it something that you can have by intuition know that it's going to come certain days versus other days it doesn't for whatever reason? Or do you prepare for it? Is Does it get in the way at, at all of what you're doing? Oh, well, it never gets in the way of what you're doing. In fact, it empowers you because, you know, well, let me just go back a minute. The sensitivity of, of orchestra players is such that they know that if I turn my body, my chest, my heart to some part of the orchestra, but my eyes are looking at that player, but my hand is aimed at that player, that sound will be quite different if my hand is reached out, is reaching out to the first violins, but my heart is aimed at the timpani and my eyes are looking at, the, at somebody else. We instinctively know how music is somehow a metaphor of not only who we are physically, but who we aspire to spiritually. And, That's beautiful. And a conductor is always moving it, 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 either through technique or intuition or willingness to understand what these different notes mean. And we're shifting. We're never solitary. Static. Yeah. Never. Never. I mean, mind you, a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, when conducting was kind of being invented, and we could ask answer the question of why was it invented? And it has to do with the complexity of music when it became right. more complex, when people weren't playing all the time, when it wasn't a one tempo thing where someone was playing the yeah. harpsichord. You give a great history of it in this book, guys. It's well, really amazing. Thanks. But, but so we became a kind of necessary evil, but then composers knew that they had conductors so they could write things that could otherwise never happen without a conductor right. right one of the things for example that an orchestra cannot do without a conductor is accelerate or decelerate together i mean they can follow everybody's quiet here and everybody's loud here right but they cannot actually figure out how they put their their notes in the right in the right place when something is moving forward and then something is slowing down. So that's one of the simple things that starts to happen in music where it's actually written affrettando or accelerando right. or you know beschleunigen, whatever words it says. Whatever language. That's right. So so you start to see that happening, but there's much more to it than that. So the whole concept of the spirituality of what we're what we're doing is has to do with the metaphor that is implicit in this thing called music. Now in the other book, um, which is called For the Love of Music, which is a conductor's guide, right? Um, I, after, the, after writing the, the, the Maestro book, my um, editor wanted a book about music, just to talk about it, not what a conductor does. And it made me, of course, think about this issue of what it is. Now, let's just talk a little bit about what it is. Um, first of all, it's useless. I mean, from the point of view of utilitarian, it's not utilitarian. Right. It, it doesn't protect your family. It doesn't feed them. It doesn't guard you. Um, it, it's ambiguous. And yet, we invented it. Humans invented it. Yeah, birds do bird songs and there's whales, but that's, that's kind of different from a Mozart symphony, right? It's, it, 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 it's true that, that there are sounds that animals make that may be worn or that are used for mating and imitation of, of certain bird calls. We get that. However, this idea of music as we know it is something that is so developed in humans and yeah. every instrument has a history that goes back to the Stone Age. I mean, why did the first human pick up a femur of a dead animal and blow into it. Now, I imagine right. in, in this book, it was to bring it back to life because your exhalation would be the sound of life, right? In, out. So somebody took this bone and went, 
And it did come back to life, but not the way it was when it was an animal, but it now made a sound. So, right. ooh. Ah. And once you did it, because we are mimics, we repeated it. Ooh. Now, at some point, someone figured out by making a hole in it, it went, who. So you have who. Dif different ooh. pitches. And it started, well, from a that scale. moment until 1851, it became a flute. Why did we keep wanting to perfect it? Why, once we did that, and that's just the flute, <laughs> we can talk about all the other instruments. With each technological improvement, metallurgy, oh, we, devent, we invented brass. We figured out by adding tin to copper, we have brass. So we made breastplates, we made forks and knives, and we made a trumpet. <laughs> Why? You know, we made gongs. So we wanted to pray to God and we created these gongs. When you hit them and they vibrate and they seem to go on forever and they seem to communicate to the great spirit. Now, we have always, this is a human thing. And in addition to that, Fredji, um, people move. And when they move from place to place, they carry their music, they sing and they dance and they invent these instruments. And other people then hear that music and they imitate it. But also when they go to a new place, there's music there that's different from the music you had and people start to imitate it. So there's no such thing as any, every piece of music is world music. Every note that we play somehow reverberates with the entire history of our species. So you can say that, yeah, this rag ragtime comes from maybe Scott Joplin in, in New Orleans, but then George Gershwin wrote ragtime, and then Duke Ellington also wrote ragtime, but then he developed it into jazz. Just go through that list. If you think about right. think about uh, the, the uh, Silk Road, right? For 2,000 years, it already existed when silk was brought to ancient Rome all the way the thousands of miles of carrying this fabric across deserts mountains people different peoples different cultures were singing and they were hitting drums or playing instruments whatever it was they get so the music is constantly adumbration of sounds of, of different kinds of music different rhythms they get to rome and what do they hear they hear roman music but what's roman music well it's greek music but it's also music from Ethiopia, it's music from North Africa. It's because when these empires so-called conquered a land, what happened? Well, two year, by two years later, the food in Rome is right. Ethiopian food and the dancers are from Ethiopia and the instruments are Ethiopian. And suddenly over a period of maybe 50 years, Roman music is also Ethiopian music. Right. So no matter where you go, if you go to Peru, for example, and you go into the mountains of Peru, you'll find that there are children who are performing Baroque music because the Jesuits, when they went to Peru and they thought they were going to build these, um, these utopian societies where God and, and, and agriculture and music would sustain the people. Yeah, the well, movie The Mission with Robert De Niro and Ennio Morricone's music is a great uh, well, there movie you to are. watch so, about that. Yeah. Exactly. So when the missionaries are thrown out, what's left? <laughs> the music. So in the 21st century, there are children in the mountains of Peru who are singing Baroque music. Why? Because they like it, by the way. They don't have to. See, that's the right. great thing about music. If you love it, you repeat it and you make right. it your own. Now, regarding this mindset, because we, we know about the techniques to become a conductor and all the study involved in the craft of the music itself, but the mindset on a philosophical human level that you've learned to get into prior to standing on a podium in front of a hundred professional musicians who all have an individual expression and idea of what that music should be how have how did you practice or or condition yourself to be able to stand there vulnerable like you said yourself and be able to remain open despite the perceived tension and all the politics and all of these other things that are in the air you know that's the ultimate 
challenge because there's no place to really study it. I mean, you can watch it. I think most conductors learn conducting from another conductor. You, you really sorcerer apprentice. Uh, right. But then the apprentice also has to have a little apprentice orchestra somewhere in the side to try it. Because there are certain things I do as a conductor. When I look at a video, I say, oh, Lenny, or, I, or in the case of Giulini, Carlo, or, or, or Stokowski. And what's interesting there is that 18 years with Leonard Bernstein, a couple of years with Stokowski, and maybe eight hours with Giulini, they all have equal force in my life. Uh, and that's, again, the odd thing. It's, it's a little bit like you know paint. You take paint from a can and you put it on a wall and it beads up. You take a different paint and you put it on the wall and it sticks because you can't, some of it just doesn't stick to you. You just can't do it. You could try to imitate it, but it doesn't work for you. I mean, Lenny could do things that nobody could do because of right. his mind and his body, right? Uh, you watch Stokowski with those long fingers, which I do not have, and he would pull music out of, out, of, out of the orchestra in a way that you just can't imagine how he did that. And with Carlo, who, who really had the weakest technique but he was such a spiritual man. I mean, this is a man who hid in, in a farmhouse basement during World War II wow. because he was going to be killed during the, the era when Italy withdrew from World War II and all of its uh, uh, alliances with the Nazis. And they thought the war was over, except that the Nazis had second thoughts about that. And so they came marching in and uh, rounded up and, you know, and killed a lot of Italians, shot them, hung them, put them in concentration camp. And Carlo lived in this darkest place and came out of it as one of the most spiritual human beings, modest beyond words. I mean, just this man. And he would stand there in front of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, which is the only time I saw him. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, he was uh, conducting the Unfinished Symphony of Schubert. It was the first movement and I was in the wings and I had a chair and this was a, a concert that was not in their normal hall. So they were out somewhere in Los Angeles doing a, a run out concert. So I was sitting on a fold folding chair behind the last stand of first violins. I, I couldn't be seen. There was, you know, it was a, like a high school auditorium. And, it, and Carlo was conducting. And at one point he looked out at the first violins and he did that. I mean, his hand opened, and I, I mean, as a, as a Catholic, you, you cannot see this without one asking for alms, but also of the crucifixion. There's something, and he did this gesture, and I'm sitting there, and I'm hearing, you know, da, 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 and, and it stops, and, and then it goes into these terrible chords of demonic possibility and I suddenly realized that that first movement was really about life and death and good and evil and that Schubert was a Catholic I'd never thought about that before. just with that gesture yeah because so there's there's definitely something extra sensory going on there absolutely but that's what I'm, that's that electricity and and the other thing about the electricity if we might keep that going yeah. a little while is that it's alternating current mm. because you are giving back into the orchestra and they're giving it to you. And at every moment, all of those maestros in the orchestra, every one of them is telling you something. And, right. you, and so you ask the question, how do you prepare for that? Um, it's actually um, success and failure, success and failure. You, you, as a kid, you say things and you realize that that was a real mistake or you, you do something. You, there might be a technical error, which is horrible because you you make everybody make a mistake. See, if if I make a mistake, everybody's probably going to make a mistake because half of them are going to think, oh, he's just made a mistake. And the other half said, I'm going to follow him. And right. what's a mistake? So a bar is in five. You conducted in a four. A bar is in three. What something like that. You just you give an upbeat where you should have given a downbeat and have right. people come in. 
that is the most thoroughly, I mean, that's seared into my brain. I, I know every time I've ever done one of those things for 55 years, and I can recite them and confess them to you publicly for your next program. <laughs> however, the, however, there's the other part of this, which is that you do something and it doesn't work. Sometimes I learned that you say, actually, I'm getting in your way. So I'm going to start you and then I'll come back out of it because some music is so complicated that the conductor's part is written against the music. It's a kind right. of an energy thing that happens in the 20th century, mostly, where, a com you know, music is like a grid. And so you have these up and down lines that tell you the, the, from which everything is marked as far as up and down and where it ha happens. Now, if a piece of music goes dump, da, da, dump, da, da, dump, da, that's fine because you're giving the downbeat with the strongest beat. But sometime in the, er, in the late 19th century, they started to move it off the beat to give it a kind of energy. So bump, 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 bump. Well, okay, you can easily start to creep into where, where the music is as opposed to how it's notated. That uh, may have been a little complicated, right. but the bottom line is that you have to also be humble enough to say, I'm sorry, I'm getting in your way here and let them do it. So it's trial and error. And mm -hmm. if they're kind enough to you, you, you live, you survive. They you invite think, you back. <laughs> do you think, John, it has something to do with you becoming a complete, more complete human being unfolded in all your development potentials and talents that those become virtues themselves and musicians as human beings will respond instinctively to that? I think so. That's sometimes the case if they give you the time to develop. I mean, they're always, we depend on orchestras, we depend on singers, we, we don't make any sounds. You know, we appear to be in charge. And in some ways, of course, we are. But fundamentally, unless you understand that this is a give and take, you can't do it. In right. other words, if, if we played a video of Arturo Toscanini playing and you showed that to an orchestra and you said, okay, follow that, it wouldn't work. Right. Because he's breathing and hearing and they're breathing and hearing and so, and he's now dead. So, you know, you, you can't, you would think if it was as simple as that, we would just have a video of Herbert von Karajan or anybody you name and that, right? And everybody would just play it. And it doesn't, It that's, I mean, that is the great quote era demonstrandum, that it's not just about this. It's something much bigger. Because most human uh, communication is telepathic. Let's face right. it, it is telepathic. Right. We have words. But when we invented music, and when we developed this thing, this metaphor, and there's all kinds of music in the world, and as I said, all of this music is, is connected to each other was when the Portuguese got to Japan, they heard music they never heard before, but also the Japanese heard music they never heard before. And of course, they also got words they never had before, right? We told obrigado, those becomes, you know, arigato gozaimasu. Right. So the, even the word for thank you in Japanese is a Portuguese word because they had no word for it. So, right. but we're, as I said, we're imperfect mimics. So they couldn't say obrigado, they said arigato, which is, how they could say it in their language. So again, we have this world of music where we're all connected. However, one kind of music develops in Europe that is unique from the other kinds because it becomes narrative, it becomes more metaphoric, and it has an ability to, to describe things and to elevate how we are. All music, by the way, is dangerous because it does control behavior. And everybody right. knew that. In right. Confucius's time, music was not an art, it was part of public administration. I mean, think about that. We, we think of music as one of the arts because that comes from the Latin and the Greek idea of the trivium and quadrivium and you know what we consider music and art. But let's take it out of that world for a minute. What, what is it? It's invisible. It's the only art yeah. form that's invisible, right? So it's sneaky, it's sneaky. You can make rules about it. You can lock it in behind ghettos or you can have slaves quarters over here. But if somebody hears the music coming out of the slaves quarters into the place where the masters are hearing the slaves music, pretty soon 
that music is going to be on both sides of that fence, right. on both sides of that wall. The wall, there is no wall. It's like Doctors Without Borders. It's just the sound. Right. So, but this music that you know finds fulfillment in in Europe and with with composers as, as varied, you know, whether you're talking about Bach or Gabrielli, or you now you're moving toward toward Beethoven and Wagner, where we can where that music has kind of like words where where it describes things. <clears throat> so there's music that makes you uplifted. It makes music that pulls you together, music to frighten you, music to make you unhappy, music that's sexy, music that, you know, there's always been music that can put you into a state, right? There's right. dance music, you have dervish music, you've got music for rituals where people are chanting. But what happens when you have to write music to tell a really complex story like Aida? Right. Or, right. Or, and and so this music, which is very descriptive and becomes a language, gets promulgated worldwide because of movies. Now, this is another this is the third book. This is the book that will come out next spring. Oh, great. But, but the idea here is that if people didn't like this music, it wouldn't be repeated. Right. right. We, we don't have a world in which there are kabuki music orchestras in every country of the world. And yet we have orchestras, Western orchestras, European orchestras in every country in the world. All over the it's world. It's not because yeah. it's better. It's just because right. people want to hear it. And and because it has an adaptability and uh and it's easy to understand, but complex in what it is saying. So we have a world where 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 we can pull people together with a Beethoven nine. I mean why why, for example, on January first is it a, na a national ritual in Japan to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? Right, that's already like, because they want to hear it, because it's uplifting, because its message of, of un unity of people is aspirational, that people want to hear. If they didn't want to hear those words by Schiller to that music, they'd say, don't give me that. You don't, don't give me propaganda about everybody's, everybody's a brother and a sister. I don't want that. Well, they wouldn't right. play it, right? But we actually want that. And that's the thing about the spirituality of music. That's the thing that pulls it together and why it's so fundamentally important. Because I think it communicates these virtues that we all aspire to become in us that is part of our common humanity. And it's so, um, it's so well communicated in the Western classical music that I think you're talking about because of all its layers of complexity when you compare it to other music, right? And, and the only thing I would say is because even in the, um, for the love of music, you just use the word Western, um, and we tend to use that word. I would love to take that and throw yeah. it somewhere else because of West of what um, would be the question. Right. And the, and, and the reason we say that, Reggie, is, is because it was the Greeks who first described it. Right? So the, the music that they talk about and the function that music has in and how we behave and how certain music can make us act violently and certain music can make us better people and calm or bring us bring us joy at the end of our day's work that is why it's called western music not because it really is because right. so much of it is also indigenous music that has been collected and repeated for hundreds of thousands of years just like that flute which started out as a femur or a conch shell or something that someone picked up 200,000 years ago and that now is a flute <laughs> that's right. playing in an orchestra when you're sitting i think that's the part of it it because or because it represents continuity it, it stands for every human who ever walked the face of the earth and it's now and it's also the future you know we we know we're mortal creatures but it's impossible for us to actually imagine mortality we try right Right. And we know it, down. but yeah. I, you mentioned the word continuity and the word future, John. And actually, this was in my mind to, to ask you, as a conductor who has had decades of experience, practical experience, do you see a progress in the field of conducting that has happened? And if you could envision what would be some of the things in the future that could make the art of conducting more effective in communicating the music as it was intended. 
Oh. Well, just the end of the sentence just took me by surprise because as it was intended, so if, I'll spend a moment with as it was intended. Please, please, you don't yeah. Mind, because yeah, take your time. You, you had a sentence that went, <laughs> and now, so as it was intended, every composer, no matter how um, persnickety, difficult, demanding he or she was, wrote music. Therefore, a composer knows it's never going to be the same twice. It can't be. It can't be. You've just you've just written music. Paint a painting. You want it to be the same? Paint a painting. And just make sure that somebody is going to keep it refreshed 200 years from now if anybody cares about you. So the right. varnish needs to be thick. But if you're going to write music, it's always going to be different. It's always going right. to change. So as intended, I think the part as intended means that it communicates, that it right. connects. It's like that little uh, bar, that thing that goes across in your computer when you're uploading information. If it doesn't get to the end, it didn't arrive. I remember, we, remember we first were using computers and we were uploading information. We thought, oh, well, we got 90% of it. But no, then you found out it wasn't there because it didn't reach its goal. So right. if our performances, no matter who it is, doesn't connect to the public, it didn't exist. It's like the tree falling in the forest and there's no one there. Did it make to a sound? You. Right. The concert didn't exist if it doesn't connect to the goal, which is the public. So that's what is intended by the composer. So we can say, oh, uh, historically informed performances or this is the tempo that Mahler conducted it at in 1909, but now this is twice as slow. It's not right. Well, it's right if it works. You know, and what's right. so interesting about what does it mean to work? So to answer the first part of your question, like how can how is conducting getting better, whatever that is, um, I think the big difference is that there's an awareness that the gender issue with conducting is one of the last bastions of male dominance in performing music. We have uh, not thought twice about having women play violin concertos or then play the piano, uh, play certain feminine instruments like the flute. But really, the conductor was the was the last place. Uh, we we went in the 1960s. But first of all, Lenny was one of the first, maybe the first American to prove that an American could conduct Mozart and Beethoven with the Vienna Philharmonic and not make it sound like it's George Gershwin, but it right. could be really good and it really connected to the public. And then you had Seiji Ozawa and you had Zubin Mehta proving that you didn't have to be a Caucasian male or indeed a European male to conduct at the highest levels of music um, and in interpreting Beethoven and Bach because it was international. It was already something that was in the world's blood. Right. Uh, so now we're seeing that women are able to stand up in front of orchestras and and conduct. So this is already a huge difference. Uh, uh, whether women as a sex in, will interpret Beethoven differently across uh, from gender bounds or, or not is to be known. Actually, if it works for you, if you if it communicates to you, then it is a valid performance. Right. right. However, I'm going to say that on the other hand, we are always in the state of studying and we try to crawl into Mahler. What was Beethoven about? You know, if you, if you love painting, you can go see the Sistine Chapel and you can look up at it. But if you are a conductor, the equivalent of that would be, I can change the color spectrum of the Sistine Chapel. I can make God's finger longer. I can, I can focus you on, on the look on Adam's face, right? Because I can slow down. And I can bring out the violas, which may be the equivalent of his eyes. Mm -hmm. I can change the proportions of the Statue of David. This is the magic of, of music because you can make it longer, shorter, durational time, actual time, emotional time, personal time, um, because it's perceived through time. And right. so what an amazing, impossible job it is. I mean, so... <laughs> You know, I, I I have to say, it's it's either the most ridiculous thing you can do, or the most sublime. 
Beautiful. And uh, you mentioned something about telepathy and our technology is improving incredibly fast in the last few decades compared to the thousands of years we've lived on this planet. And you mentioned that the majority of the communication between the conductor and the orchestra is telepathic. Do you envision that this will expand the bandwidth of that ability in the next few decades? And will that perhaps change the way music is performed? I think there, I, I don't, I think the fundamental issue of live performance goes back as far back as groups of humans gathering around the fire. There you go. To the very thing you talk about, the very name of what we are talking about today. Right. We have a desire to share. We, we come in the night, but sit by the light of the fire. Well, that's already says everything now, doesn't it? So yeah. you, can, you can have recordings now. You can have terrific sound systems. You can listen to music while you're doing other things. You can play Wagner's Ring of the Nibelungen without leaving your chair. However, the human desire to collect with other humans in the dark around the fire will the never communion, go away. It's that who feeling we are. of communion, right? So we are the fire, right? We are the fire. So that will never change. We don't invent the fire. We are the carriers of the fire. Yeah. We're, 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 we've been given the honor to carry the fire and to bring that to the people in the dark to illuminate their lives. Well said. And that's actually the root origin of the word art it comes from ars, like arson, which is fire, light. Yes. So it's the yes. perfect word for it. Yes. Well, John, I, we could be hours here talking about music and the subtleties and the magic and the spiritual sublime aspects of it, but we're running out of time. But I am humbled, honored, and deeply, deeply grateful for this experience that we've had around the fire with you. And I just want to thank you for being the human being that you are and for bringing this joy, this life, and this illuminating art of music, which is so abstract and yet so universal at the same time to all of us. And I hope that we have a chance to hear you at a live concert in a jam-packed hall mm -hmm. full of people very, very soon as we return to normal in the world. Thank you so much, Reggie. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. We're going to close with our closing vignette and invite you to join us around the fire in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.